the environment that we flew in was four to six feet above the highest obstacle. Oh, wow. So when I say we're looking them in the white of the eyes, the normal engagement distance was 25 meters. We could see them, we could hear them, we could smell them. Uh, we followed, we were combat trackers from helicopters. We followed footprints and that sort of thing. Welcome to the Titan Protection Show. I am Ryan Smith here with Josh Leon and special guest today, Hugh Mills, the uh, Chief of Security for Kansas City Transportation Authority. And Chief, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing some airtime with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Glad to be here. And this was exciting for me because I've got a couple things. I mean, one, aviation, security, and law enforcement. That's kind of your bread and butter and, and three things that are, are interesting to me. And I wanted to start. You've got a pretty impressive resume, and I just wanted to capture a couple of these things. And also, um, probably start out with some of the aviation stuff. I've heard a couple rumors. I'm interested to see if uh, if they're true or not <laughs> okay. from your right. uh, flying experience. But, right. um, so just a kind of general background, because again, your, your resume is pretty impressive. Uh, from an education standpoint, got a bachelor's degree in aeronautical management from uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Correct. A master's degree in military art and science from U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. Yes. And a master's in public administration from Central Michigan University. Is that, Correct. Uh, did I leave anything out? Is there anything from your education background that I missed there? No. Well, Hot Springs High School. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Hot Springs, Arkansas? Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. With a uh, classmate of Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton's. I was yeah. going to bring okay. that up. Yeah. You were a classmate of Bill Clinton's? Bill and I were next door neighbors. Yeah. Growing up, yeah. Are you kidding? No. Oh, yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. That's, uh, well, <laughs> and as I continue here, I mean, that's where your your background, that's why I was excited to have you come on. Is uh, He was is the second impressive. most famous guy to come out of Hot Springs High School. The most famous was Cliff Harris, Dallas Cowboys the Staubach era, he and Charlie Waters were the uh, defensive safeties, and Cliff just went into the NFL Hall of Fame last year. No and kidding. I believe there's a signed picture by him in your office. Yes, there is. Yeah. Yes, there is. Yeah. yeah. Cliff, no Cliff like, and caught I, my eye right away. Cliff yeah. and I played junior high ball together, and I used to kibitz him about his ability. He was third string. I was a, a, a second string defensive end. And uh, he, he rubs that in my face with that with that NFL Super Bowl. He the, seems uh, to have caught up with the you, Hall Chief. of Fame. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and then we get into your your career here, and, and again, equally as uh, impressive. But Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, 1967, 1993. Correct. Is that years about right? Yes. Um, then Director of Security for Hunt Midwest for a couple years, and then you went to Worlds of Fun, the local amusement park, and was Director of Security there. Yeah, the Hunt Midwest uh, gig was Worlds of Fun in those days. And then Hunt Midwest Entertainment sold the park to Cedar Fair. Okay. And I was one of two assets within the organization that made the transfer. Went over. No kidding. Yeah. Okay. And then spent some time managing power and light security for those folks. There for a year. There for a year. Yep. Um, and then you were supervisor of flying for Kansas City Police Department from 82 to 2009. Correct. And uh, was that, how'd you get into that, or what were, were the duties associated with well, that? Well, I, I was a pilot, and that was kind of a requirement. Right. <laughs> that was the starting yeah. point. Yeah. The Kansas City Police Department, uh, when I first came aboard as a reserve officer back in, in the in, uh, 80, um, had huge 300s. Okay. And um, they asked me to fly for them part-time, which I did. And then later on, um, they sought to acquire better aircraft. I was the Army rep to the FAA here in Kansas City at that point in time, and I assisted them in the the acquisition of five OH-6 uh, aircraft on the uh, Law Enforcement Support Office I'm program. Kidding. What year was that, 82? Uh well, what, when they got the aircraft or when? When you were dealing with the FAA. I only asked that. My grandfather worked in the FAA in the Kansas City office. He was deputy director of the Midwest reason. I didn't well, have I, any I was I was the advisor to the regional director from 1988 to 1993 when I retired. I retired from the Army from that job. I was okay. down downtown at the uh, federal building. 
Interesting. I what don't was, know if you got, his, his name was Daniel Barrow, Edward Barrow. I think he was earlier. He started as a controller in the 30s. Yeah, I, I don't mean, know the I don't know the name. Yeah, it's been a while. Long I wanted shot, to preface but. the audience after what uh, Chief Mills just just did to you there. That that was pretty pretty funny. Chief Mills will go weapons hot <laughs> on any not only any Titan entity but any KCPD, any security entity or uh, individual who has chosen to ask him what he deems a foolish question. Well, I appreciate. It. I, I like, get a lot I of like them. The, <laughs> the directness, but okay. So, and I want to circle back to the military stuff, but finish kind of your resume here of, of professional career. You then went uh, and were under sheriff for Jackson County, Missouri, which, if anybody's not around uh, the Kansas City area, that encapsulates the uh, the Kansas City Metro. Correct. Um, and you were there for nine years, right? Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine to two thousand nineteen. Okay. And then became chief of uh, security for Kansas City Transportation Authority, which is your current role. That's correct. Is that accurate? So one of the and, and before I move on to a couple honors and awards, uh, Arkansas Aviation Hall of Fame and U.S. Army Aviation and Army Officers Candidate School Hall of Fame honors Correct. and awards that went along with that. So, yep. uh, again, pretty uh, pretty substantial background and, and resume there that's impressive. And like I said, the aviation, the law enforcement, and the security is is something that was interested to me. And I kind of want to dive a little deeper into some of those. Sure. But the rumors that I have heard, and one I was dying to ask about this, was one I heard somebody told me years ago that you hold the record for being shot down the most times in a helicopter or something in Vietnam. Is, that any, I, I, is there I, any truth to that? I, I'd be right up there. No um, kidding. I, 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 I only crashed once. Okay. And and that was uh, that was because I shot myself down. That's another story. But <laughs> but uh, fifteen, uh, I was shot down fifteen times in three tours. Okay. And then I shot myself down once on my second tour. Wow. That, I mean, is incredible. And the other rumor that I heard that went along with that was you were the youngest person to lead a battalion of helicopters or something. I, I And I got that. Somebody said, well, everybody else had been shot down, so you were kind of next in line with it. <laughs> I, was, I was a troop commander in Vietnam at 24. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. And kind of starting with that, how did you go into the military knowing you wanted aviation or how did you get into the aviation? No, no, part? actually, um, I, I, when I came out of Hot Springs High School, um, uh, I went to Arkansas Tech at Russellville, Arkansas. Uh, didn't know what I wanted to do, but after the first semester, I had done exceptionally well in ROTC and the Sport Parachute Club. Okay. Everything else was an abject failure. <laughs> Um, that was kind of a clue to me that if, it, you know, ROTC and, and the parachute club, uh, I decided to enlist in the Army as a paratrooper. And that's what I did in February of, of 67. Okay. While I was in um, basic training, I took the various tests that everybody takes. And the, uh, the first lieutenant who was the company commander called me in uh, one afternoon and said, uh, you need to go to OCS. You've got the scores to go to OCS. And um, he said, but you you, you got to give up your guaranteed assignment to an airborne unit. And I almost didn't take it for that for that reason. But I called my dad, who had been a, an officer in World War II, and he said, no, you're, you're going to take it. And, uh, and so I did. Right. I didn't want him coming down from Arkansas and, and forcing me, so, <laughs> right. which he would have done. Yeah. But I... I took the OCS program, Armor, at Fort Knox. And uh, toward the end of the OCS program, they were looking for helicopter pilots. And they said, anybody that has these scores might want to apply. And I had those scores, so I applied. And, and I had to take a uh, orientation flight in an Army helicopter at Godman Army Airfield at Fort Knox. And that orientation flight consisted of two of us getting in the helicopter, flying to Bluegrass Army Depot, changing seats and flying back. And if it didn't scare you to death and you didn't throw up in the aircraft, you passed the orientation. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the need for pilots was fairly severe at that point in time. So that's how I got into it. And, and actually, the aircraft that I did that orientation flight in was an OH-6, okay. brand new in the inventory then. It was the new scout ship. And I just w gravitated toward that aircraft after that. And when I got through with flight school and, and uh, was assigned to Vietnam, I wound up in an air cavalry troop 
wanted to fly scouts, but there were no vacancies in January of 69. And the troop commander said, uh, uh, we're going to put you in Hueys, and then when a vacancy comes up, um, we'll, we'll consider moving you. And, and less than two months later, the scout platoon commander requested uh, a change of assignment. It was a fairly uh, uh, stressful stressful job. Yeah, I can. Um, about 80% casualties over the course uh, of the year. Of the wow. 10 guys that I started with, two of us were still standing in, in uh, December of 69. Okay. But that's what I wanted to fly, and, and that's and how I did, got into it. And when did Vietnam it. start? The advisors were there. Well, and, Vietnam started in 1945. Yeah, okay. Uh, we had advisors with the, uh, with the Viet Minh. In '45, in fact, as the Japanese capitulated, the uh, the, the guys from uh, uh, the early early uh, CIA Special Forces yeah. uh, uh, OSA, those guys were actually with the Japanese and rode on horseback into Saigon into Hanoi, excuse me, okay. um, when the armistice was signed. Wow. And we stayed for all those years, and uh, in in. Uh, it was a massacre and of the furnished French. furnished about 61. So yeah. when you signed up, it was happening. I mean, you knew you, it wasn't like you signed up and the, then the major the units, uh, The major army units went to Vietnam in 65, <clears throat> the divisions, 101st, 1st Cav, um, 1st Infantry Division, went ashore in 65. I arrived in 69, and it was still, still hot. Hot and heavy. No kidding. Wow. And so shot down 15 times. Well, but not all at once. <laughs> over, over three years. Got it. Yeah, that, that makes more sense. Actually. Yeah, it's hard to get guys when, and for some reason, that's the thing people always remember, and they don't want to fly with you after that. Right. So, it took years to get my wife to get in a helicopter with me. For I can't that, say that as I blame reason. her, yeah. Chief. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, that's got to be crazy. So, and the times that you were shot down. How did you get, I mean, did, was it just, did somebody come get you, or how did you get out of those scenarios? I mean, obviously. Well, we, f we flew, um, all of those 15 events were in OH-6s. Okay. Um, the, the mission of, a, of an air cavalry troop uh, contains 10 scout aircraft, 10 gunships, Cobra uh, helicopters, and 10 Hueys which were the transport for the 28-man rifle platoon that was organic to our unit. Okay. And the mission of the scouts was to find them. The mission of the Cobras was to fix them in position and then to develop by ground means, we would put the arrow rifles or blues on the ground. And uh, our, the environment that we flew in was four to six feet above the highest obstacle. Oh, wow. So when I say we're looking them in the white of the eyes, the, my normal engagement distance was 25 meters. Wow. We could see them. We could hear them. We could smell them. Okay. Uh, we followed, We were combat trackers from helicopter. We followed footprints and that sort of thing. No kidding. Wow. That is, so you're, uh, real, you're real close. When they decide to shoot, if they decide to shoot, you are danger close. Right. Wow. Were most of these engagements against the Viet Cong or the North Me Vietnamese Army? The Viet Cong were largely depleted by the time I got there. Almost everything that we, we engaged in from 69 through uh, 72 were North Vietnamese regulars. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And I mean, I'm just thinking about how getting shot down once sounds incredible. I mean, how do you get back into the helicopter after it gets shot down once? Well, you know, the the, the interesting thing is that when... Um, in the OH-6 series aircraft, the intermediate maintenance was at 300 hours. None of my aircraft ever made it to 300 hours. Not just mine, the whole troop. All right. You know, I had 10 of those things. None of our aircraft made it to 300 hours. They were all battle damaged, uh, evacuated. If we would lose an aircraft on Thursday, on Friday morning, we'd fly to Saigon in a Huey uh, to a helipad called Hotel Alpha. And it was the size of a probably three football fields, and it was full of brand new aircraft. And they would say, "Yours is the fourth down on the right," and we'd go get a brand new one, take it home, paint the unit markings on it, and off we go. No kidding. Wow. So um, we went through a lot of aircraft. The um, about four thousand eight hundred Army air crewmen were killed in the conflict. Um, 
very high percentage of helicopter pilots and crew members. And and largely, you know, the the OH-6, I think we sent 842 to Vietnam, and the vast majority of them were were damaged and shot down. Almost none came home. Wow. So then was that your first foray into leadership? I mean, you've had a lot of leadership positions, but I mean, running the command, it kind of, did that just get dumped in your lap because everybody else had been killed or well, how, how'd you get into that? You know, the, uh, my first uh, soiree into, into leadership was as a brand new second lieutenant. I trained cavalry troops in the M114 uh, reconnaissance vehicle at Fort Knox until I went to flight school. Okay. Then I had a year in flight school. And then when I got to Vietnam, I was initially a section commander in the, um, in the Hueys, the, the, the lift section. And then I took command of the Aero Scouts in uh, March of, of 69. So I was 21 years old. I had 10 warrant officers and one other lieutenant uh, that I outranked by about four months. And, uh, and that was my first uh, first experience. I went home from my first tour in Vietnam, commanded a uh, tank company in Germany at uh, 22. Wow. And then back to Vietnam. Um, I married my, sw- my high school sweetheart after my first tour, and we went off to Germany together to, to do a ground assignment. As a commissioned officer, I had to do ground assignments and flying assignments. Warrant officers only flew. Okay. And so I was commanding a tank company, which was my basic branch. And uh, seven months into the marriage, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Wow. So we were transferred to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, to the Brook Army Medical Center in October of, uh, of 70. And she died in February 71. Oh, wow. So I called Armor Branch and said, hey, uh, let me go back to Vietnam. Change of scenery, change of... of uh, priority get my head on something else and and they understood they knew what what had happened and so they uh, uh they said do you want a school or something en route and i said yeah let me let me try cobra school so i went through the army attack helicopter course at savannah hunter army airfield and then back to the 101st Air, airborne division uh as an aerial weapons commander uh for my second tour wow extended at the end of that tour uh, that unit stood down in February of 72. And as a second tour guy, I was offered the opportunity to go home. And I said, you know, I'd just as soon stay. And, and the troop commander uh, uh, gave me the best set of orders I've ever gotten. He says, OK, go find a job. So I picked up the phone. I called my previous unit from my first tour, Dark Horse, and said, do you, do you need any uh, You need a a loach pilot or a Cobra pilot. And the troop commander said, you know, our our scout platoon leader got killed a week ago. We got a vacancy. And that's how I got the third tour. So I I headed off down there and and commanded the outcasts again with the same call sign, Dark Horse 1-6, for another year. Wow. That's impressive. So were all of those 15 times you were shot down over the first tour, or was that kind of spread out over the first and third? Um over the first and third and then I was I went down on a Cobra on my second tour um, I, I tell people I shot myself down it was a malfunction in the aircraft I had a a uh, rocket pod ignite a rocket during a gun run and the rocket did not depart the tube it exploded blew off the tail rotor tail rotor took the tail and uh, we went in in a in a uh, um, spiraling descent from 5,000 feet into triple canopy jungle and we're on the on the ground for a day or so until we were finally rescued wow that's uh just hearing the story makes me not want to get into a helicopter let alone i don't know how i I, do that that many times and then hop right back in the saddle that is impressive it's it's humbling well when you're you know when when the key the key is 22 single right um, you're, you're flying the hottest stuff the Army's got. They're paying you. I, they paid us really well. I mean, almost 500 a month. Holy shit. <laughs> sounds, uh, like, sounds like you were underpaid. 500 bucks a month is, is what we made my first tour. Um, but you know, when I went in the Army, I think it was $98 a month as a, as a E2. Wow. wow. 
but uh, we enjoy, we enjoyed it. I mean, uh, you're 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 bulletproof. You're immortal. You're invisible. You're all those things when you're 22. Yeah. I got to hear some of this when when Hugh and I first met um, years ago, and um, a few years ago when when we, we we first signed up with the contract. And I remember sitting in his office and thinking I could. I could sit in here and listen to this all day long. Well, that's why right. I wanted to ask, because I've heard yeah. those things, and I was like, I, you know, who knows if that's like, you've kind of got a uh, Chuck Norris type of aura about you with what, you know, the stories and everything else, so I was interested well, to see nobody if will, actually nobody will fly with me. That's well, the, the problem. And I was going to ask that. When's the last time you've flown a helicopter? You just um, did something not that long ago, Yeah, I, just, I was okay. at Grand Prairie, Texas. Uh, uh, the, the, I'm still current. Uh, I maintain my medical and my. What was the one you courage. called me the other day? Where, but that was a plane where you had to fly that back for somebody. They were, I think they were going to use it Very in a show plane. or something like that. And you were telling me about that. I think it was to Arizona or something like that. And oh, that was a that was a helicopter. That was, was that a helicopter? That's an OH six. Okay. Yeah, I I generally fly Cobras and OH sixes for folks who are well off enough to own them. Yeah. And uh, and I can fly them and and not have to put the fuel and the maintenance in. Right. Yeah. Interesting. And then was your aviation career primarily helicopters? Was there any fixed wing? No, or I went else to uh, when uh, at the rank of uh, lieutenant colonel. I went through the Army uh, multi-engine fixed wing course and flew uh, King Airs. Oh, okay. We had uh, the job that I was in was Army. Uh, liaison for special operations to the FAA and I had myself a senior warrant and a sergeant major and a C-12 wow. and wherever we needed to go we, we primarily flew the C-12 we had a uh, we had a turbo 206 for a time and then an A-36 Bonanza yeah. which was actually Marty Schottenheimer's aircraft oh wow we, we uh, leased back that airplane to the FAA and we flew that for a number of years Interesting. My grandfather was a uh, B twenty five pilot in uh, in Okinawa, and, um, and and after some time there, he ended up being a, a flight instructor in Tunisia. But I never got to know him that well, and right. never got to hear some of those stories. He was pretty quiet about that stuff and, and and things like that. And so the times I've had the pleasure of of listening to Chief Mills talk, it's it's well, you're astounded. It's, fat, it's yeah. fascinating for sure. Yeah, I like the uh, you know fixed wing. Uh, I owned a Cessna 195 for a time, and I've got a lot of time in Stearman's. Yeah. Um, Is a 195 a tail tail wheel? dragger yeah. radial? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the the helicopter, a private individual, just unless you're really well healed, right, like yourself, uh, you can't uh, you can't afford to maintain and fly a helicopter. Yeah. And, and you know, I flew Kansas City's OH sixes for years. No kidding. Um, and then help them get the Hughes five hundreds that they've got now, the T tails, the newer aircraft. That's what they fly now. Yeah. Um, so whenever whenever somebody needs an aircraft moved or flown and, and uh, they call me, I'll do it. How many uh, total hours do you have? Do you know off about, the top of your head? About 12,000. Wow. That's, uh, yeah. What's considered a lot? Because I don't know. I mean, obviously, well, I mean, that sounds that, like a, That's a whole hell of a lot. 12,000. No, I, you there know, it I've goes. Got, I've got, I've got, I've got. I knew my time was coming. <laughs> I knew it was coming. I just should have shut up. I've, I've got f fraternity brothers. Um, uh, Embry Riddle was an aviation university, and most of those guys that were non military were their uh, intent to become airline pilots. I've got fraternity brothers with 20 and 30,000 hours. You know, American, retired American Airlines captains yeah. that the, flew international. You know, they, they, uh, yeah, they, they had a lot of hours. They're just adding if up If you real did it quick. for a job, yeah, that's how you build up yeah, the hours. I got you. And did, which, yeah. So, and then Vietnam ends, and you stay in the Army until 1993. Correct. Is that right? So yes. after, the, was that mostly in aviation, or how did that? Actually, I rotated back and forth. Um, um, I commanded a tank company in Germany. I commanded a uh, air cavalry troop at Fort Hood. I commanded a ground cavalry troop at Fort Hood. Um, the the aviation as a separate branch in the Army didn't occur until '84. Okay, and we were we were required to maintain our aviation proficiency even when we were on the ground. So normally, for example, in Germany we had six uh, OH-13S models in the brigade aviation section and. 
uh, in the afternoons after work or on weekends, I'd go down to the aviation section, check out an H-13, just go fly around Germany. Okay. Any I had, involve- I had, I had to do 80 hours a year. Okay. Any um, involvement and in, or advising in, in the Panama deployment at all? No. Okay. No. Yeah, just wondering. I, I was thinking about the years. No. And then, so to kind of bridge that gap of you know, you're the military and then into law enforcement. So 93, you get out. It looks like you kind of moved into the uh, security side of things. What was that transition like? Was that purposeful? Did you know what you wanted to do when you got out of the military, or how'd you make that transition? Actually, when I got out of the military, uh, I had been uh, the the army rep here to the FAA, but also several years before had gone through the army or the uh, KCPD. Uh, reserve officer program. So okay. I'd been working one night a week as a, as a patrol officer in the inner city. And I was approached by the chief of police at that point in time and asked me if I would consider when I retired coming over to the academy and uh, replacing Jim Lindell when he retired. I'd been working with Jim for years. And uh, and I, I did that. So I retired on a Friday and went to work for the regional police academy on the following Monday. <laughs> Okay. And I did that for a year and then, frankly, was hired away by Lamar Hunt, who had some security uh, concerns at Hunt Midwest Entertainment and asked me to come over there. And, uh, and I did. I stayed there for 15 years. And, uh, and then when I retired from there, I, went, I, I helped establish the Power and Light District okay. for the first year. And then when Mike Sharp was elected sheriff in Jackson County, he asked me to come over and be the undersheriff. No kidding. Yeah. Okay. And that was one of the questions I was going to ask because the undersheriff, I didn't know whether that was elected or not. So Mike Sharp gets elected and then says, it's hey. An it's an appointed position. The, the undersheriff actually does all the work. <clears throat> okay. The, the sheriff doesn't do anything. Um, <laughs> they, go to, they go to parties. They kiss babies. You know, that, right. that sort of thing. Very political, yeah. especially in Jackson County. And I am about as apolitical as you can get Yeah, and uh, for a Republican. <laughs> and and uh, um, it, it's actually the day-to-day running of the sheriff's office. And there were two of us. Ben Kenny was the other undersheriff. There were okay. two. Um, I did patrol, TAC, and, uh, and communications initially. And he had courtroom security investigations. And that's how services. Denning ran his crew out of Johnson County. He had two under sheriffs and he would, you know, one was more administrative stuff and one was more field stuff. Yeah, and field he would stuff. separate that up. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that was where we first crossed paths. I don't know if you remember this or not, but years ago, and I forget, I can only remember one of the gentleman's names. It was Russell Beach. And I only sure. remember that name because Muscle B. I always get, but there was another captain, and I was pitching the um, video monitoring stuff, and there were some sites, and and I will say, and I had to have been probably 2012, 2013, maybe, um, somewhere in that neighborhood, and at the time nobody really knew what video monitoring was or anything else, but mm-hmm. I will say you guys were very receptive to that and ended up deploying a unit, but. The captain, I remember, stood up and he said, you know, we've got these alarm systems and different stuff, but if we can verify it with video, we'll put a helicopter up, we'll do all this different stuff because we know it's actually happening and not a glitch or a false alarm or something like that. So I don't know if you remember that or not at all, but you remember that. I would imagine that was probably the courthouse security guys because they had all the video. Okay. Jackson County has three different courthouses. Okay. And all of them were backed up with video. Yeah, that was good. Uh, yeah. It was, yeah, Russ Beach was, was out there in uh, judicial security at that time. Okay, cool. Well, and then so the, the undersheriff thing, and then th- you did that for 10 years, and was that all under Mike Sharp? Right. Uh, I, I, uh, I got to a point where I was, I was ready to retire. He didn't think he was going to run for another term. And since I served at the, at the pleasure, I said, you know, this is probably a great time just to retire. Right. It was retirement number three, and uh, Robbie Mackinnon, who was the CEO of the Transit Authority, called me and said, come and, come and talk to me, and he wouldn't say any more than that, and, and I've known Robbie for years, um, and I went to talk to him. He says, I want you to come and help me fix the security uh, issues that we have with the Transit Authority, and I said, Robbie, I'm retiring, and he says, give me two years. That was six years ago. <laughs> And uh, and uh, sometime next year, I'm going to I'm going to pull the plug for the fourth time. You know, Jesse and I have discussed that there, there's probably going to be some wages 
on on this wager. <laughs> so I, I don't think anybody's buying that. But well, you know, there, there's lots of things I want to do that I can't do. We we uh, we have a home in Florida. My wife is from Florida, so when her folks passed, uh, she commuted those. Uh, assets into a home in Naples and she's actually there now when a cold wind blows in Kansas City she heads she, to Florida she's, she's on Southwest yeah um, but she's retired uh, 30 years six months with KCPD as a vice detective and uh, you know there's some things I'd like to do there's some traveling I've got to, uh, I've got a, a load of friends worldwide that I'd like to go and so I got a buddy in Russia that I've never never met yeah uh, retired Russian uh, MI-24 pilot. Oh, wow. And we correspond routinely, and he he lives in Siberia. Of all the places that you probably wouldn't want to go, he lives on Lake Bacall in Siberia, and I would love to go there. Well, this is probably not the time politically. <laughs> probably, to go. Uh, pro- probably true. And I was also trying to, I was also trying to envision the discussion of you trying to take Mrs. Mills to Siberia. Oh, I th- she would, she would go. Would she, she really? She wouldn't go to Alaska years ago. Yeah. When I, I went up to do a because if you were asking me to leave Naples, Florida, for Siberia, <laughs> I, only because it was the Siberia, not lesser Siberia. Understood. She would, I, I think. I think I could get her to go once, but it'd be a, it'd be a sale. Yeah, yeah, You'd have to sell it. Well, so, and then you got into the the transportation authority. One of the things I kind of wanted to talk about was, and, and I think we find a lot of people coming from law enforcement to private sector and making different transitions in their career. How was that transition for you from military to private, back to public, and back and forth? And kind of what advice would you give for folks that are making that transition? Because I think a lot of people come out of law enforcement or military and are looking how to get into a a career like that. But um, any thoughts or advice on the transition? You know, the biggest difference that I recall, uh, the difference between military and civilian is it doesn't make any difference how much it costs in the military. Right. It makes a difference on the civilian side is what your budget is. Right. Um, 27 years in the Army, I never had a budget. You know, if I needed more bullets, I got more bullets. Right. If I needed two more helicopters, I got two more helicopters. You, that doesn't work that way in the civilian side. Um, that's the biggest difference. Yeah. Um, it was like, what What do you need to complete the mission in the military? And now it's how can you fit this within a budget or exactly within the right. constraints? Of, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. That is a struggle. That is a struggle for a lot of people to wrap their heads around. Well, and then you get into it's not like what's your budget, but then it's like because we run into that all the time. It's do you want security or do you want to check a box that you have security and you want the least amount that you can spend? I agree with that. that. I was more going from the scope of former police officers that work for us that have the that making that transition from yes. they've all done it right they've, they, they've all done it i've watched it, but for some of them it's been very very painful when they come to me or they'll say but you know if we needed this many rounds at the police department or whatever they, we, we just got them i said i understand yeah. that yeah, yeah it, it, it's I'm not kidding, man. It, 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 some of them struggle sure. greatly. Yeah. With it. Well, and that's yeah. why I bring it up because that transition's real. I mean, you it's, know, the other the, the, the other facet of that has been what I call the emergence of the lawyers. <clears throat> there weren't any lawyers in Vietnam. All right. And now, in a military unit uh, over overseas, most major decisions are driven by concurrence from the staff judge advocate. We never. I never saw a staff judge advocate in, in Vietnam. The legal aspects of, of what we do are far more defined and critical on the civilian side, right. largely because of the liability. There, there, was, there was no personal liability in combat other than if someone was foolish enough to commit a crime of some kind, right. which, which I personally never saw. Do you think that's made public safety better or worse? I know that's a loaded Sha- question. Shakespeare but. said... Let's first thing you do, kill all the kill them all. I, I right. think that's the way to go. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm good with that. Right. <laughs> um, and, and part of that transition too. I mean, you've got an impressive education history and military career. Which one do you think prepared you the best for leadership? private side of life did do you think that the education side of things was more of a check the box type of thing, or do you think it it really helped you in in the leadership and in the in the Honestly, I, I think the the doing of the leadership mission is is, is what did it. Um, 
I got my my bachelor's degree in four straight terms: Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter. So right, it, it yep. wasn't it wasn't the education that did it. I, I uh, um, part of staying in the army is a is a bachelor's degree. Uh, part of a, a regular army commission, which I got as a captain, uh, is a master's degree and attendance at the Command of General Staff College to make major. And um, uh, I think the doing it, you know, I, I've I've commanded um, a rifle squad as a, as an enlisted sergeant and an aviation section platoon troop squadron as a. As a commissioned officer, the actual doing it is, 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 I think, what prepares you. I totally agree. I mean, I'd take experience over a piece of paper, but not to say either one's not important or not to diminish any of that, but I think the reps are what... If I had not gone to Embry-Riddle, the Army was very good at the end of, at the end of Vietnam. They said, if you want to stay, you need a degree. I had a, I had a two-year equivalency, and, uh, and they said, uh, um, we're going to send you to the degree completion program. And I said, that's that's terrific. They said, you got three choices. Um, University of Nebraska in Omaha, University of Mississippi, Hattiesburg, or Embry-Riddle University in Daytona Beach. And I immediately suspected a trap. Right. I said, there's no way the Army's going to send me to Daytona Beach, Florida. But very cautiously, I said, how about Daytona Beach? They said, okay. And so they, they cut a set of orders. They said, two years, full pay and benefits. The VA pays the whole thing. I could not have, I could not have uh, asked for more. Uh, I, I met my wife there. We got married there. Um, I was in a fraternity there. They all came to the wedding. My father-in-law didn't expect that. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, he had an open bar for a Sigma Chi uh, group that came to the wedding. I think 40, 40 guys. He was mistake. Paid for he that. probably won't make again. <laughs> he, he absolutely. He paid for that for years. Yeah. 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 That that's like inviting me and the lieutenants and the captain to your house for a kegger. Right. Yeah. yeah it's not going to go well for you. Yeah. Stock up. Um, one of the other things, and in, in, uh, with thinking about the aviation thing, we're starting to get into the use of drones and how do we use mm -hmm. that for a security aspect. Mm -hmm. Have you had much interaction with any of that or thoughts? I mean, just tying in the helicopter side, but I know those are apples and oranges. The, the first interaction I had was at the sheriff's office. Um, uh, Sergeant Danny Barnes um, brought aboard and developed a drone capacity uh, within the sheriff's office, which he, we used a number of times before I retired. Um, that's the only place I've really messed with it. I've watched with great interest the use of drones by the Ukrainians yeah. in the current conflict, and um, I, I think it's 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 a brand new it's a brand new game. Right. One of my uh, dear friends uh, in in the in the Marine Corps, uh, Colonel Bob Curtis, commanded the the Marine Corps' first uh, UAV uh, element in the in no the kidding. Gulf War. Wow. And. Um, the, the things that uh, that they're able to do with UAVs and drones now. It's, it's, right. uh, I mean, you're not going to make history flying a drone, uh, right. and, and that's kind of a loss for me. You know, I, I, I'm more involved with the the pilot in combat kind right. of thing is more my view than the drone, but um, it, it's the wave of the future. There's, there's no question right. about it's it. It's an interesting technology. I mean, we've been watching it. We want to use it for outdoor protection and, and automating patrols mm -hmm. and now they have gotten to where they have docking stations to where they can charge themselves and take off and fly around the faa they're still battling through the visual line of sight rules and i think once they open that up I, I was hoping that the amazon guy could start coming by drone to my house but i live inside the airport traffic area for mci uh, to the ground you know you're uh, in the surface uh, yeah, surface to eight thousand, and okay. uh, so that's not going to happen but interesting and that's what everybody's trying to figure out now is that visual line of sight how do they because if you can't fly it beyond visual line of sight you can't make deliveries you can't really use right. them to that and it, it's interesting i mean i they've so anyway, I was just curious because I see that kind of starting to emerge, and um, uh, it's it's the infancy uh, that yes. I view right now. I, I think uh, ten years down the road, it's going to be standard. Yeah, I would agree. Um, so I think we covered most of uh, kind of the questions. One of the other things uh, we've we all manage security officers, and you certainly have had some experience with private security and certainly mm -hmm. security now. 
I was just kind of thinking as kind of wrapping things up what we've got some folks that listen that are either interested in getting into security, law enforcement, different things. Any tips or advice or things for folks that are either wanting to get into security, law enforcement, military? I know there's a lot of young folks out there that are trying to figure out which way to start. You've had a pretty incredible career that seemed to be led by uh, by starting out in the military. Would you advise others to kind of take the same path or what would your be advice? I, I will be tell to you that, young... that if if uh, if if my druthers were met, I will take a veteran over a non-veteran any day of the week simply because of the preparation they've had. They understand mission. They understand how to follow orders. They understand uh, uh, subordinating themselves to the ultimate goal. Right. Um, sometimes a pure civilian may not have that, that viewpoint, but I've found it just the other way. We've had a couple on this contract who have left us to go to the military. Right. Uh, good, good young men and women. Um, right. I think private security is a, is, a, is a wonderful employment for the right people that, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons. If you, don't, if you don't want to be in a job that takes you away from home for long periods of time, if you want to feel a sense of purpose, right? Uh, the, the guys from Titan that work for me right now are protecting thousands of people every day on buses, day and night, right? Uh, all around this metro area. Um, th- there are folks that would have uh, a, a totally different view of their their, their safety element right. without those guys and gals around them. Right. Absolutely. Well, Chief, I really appreciate you coming on. Any questions? Did I leave anything on the table here? Uh, I just, I, it's been my honor to, uh, uh, to to work, you know, for the chief for for a few years now. So well, it, just for him to stop by, I really appreciate it. I owe you one. I, I appreciate it too, and I know. Oh, you. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's yeah. a, we've we've uh, you know I, I like uh, I like what we're doing. We're trying to do more. Right. Uh, we're you know we're working with the the city now to see how we can expand and. And uh, and move uh, both uh, laterally and vertically, right? Uh, with with more assets, um, free fare is a totally new dimension in, in mass transportation. We're one of the few uh, transit organizations in the country that charges no fare. Right, right. And I remember that started a year or two ago, where Correct. they finally said we're just going to make the, the the transportation, the bus lines free. And there was a lot of talk about that. What was that going to do? Was that going to increase security needs? Have, has that happened? I mean, have we seen much of a change with that? Not, not terribly. You know, the the uh, when I first came here, the number one precipitator of, of uh, annoying events with passengers was fare disputes. Yeah. People yeah. arguing about uh, 50 cents. Uh, and then our second wave was COVID masks. And then COVID right. masks. And now it's, it's simply... Uh, uh, certain folks within the the uh, uh, the population that won't follow instructions very well, and and you know a, a bus is a dangerous environment if you don't you know you sit down when you're supposed to sit down and all that sort of thing. Right. Um, the operators run the bus; it's their office, and when folks won't do what they need them to do, sometimes there's conflict. Right. Well, and especially when you start to introduce homeless, mentally ill, intoxicated folks, that can lead to some interesting situations that's but, uh, uh, yeah that's that's correct yeah. yeah yeah we have a we have a very active unit when it comes to ata and and you know they mm-hmm. started with around 10 or 12 guys and now they're approaching that 30 number you know or 25 somewhere in that neighborhood and um they under you know the chief's guidance they, they've just done some really neat things i couldn't be prouder well and i and i agree it's kind of been a, a landmark account for us in the sense that It's rare when we get customers that say, we want security and we want to do it right. What do we need to do that? Usually the conversation is, like you were talking about with budgets and different things, is this is how much we've got to work with. How little can we pay for this or how? And it's been a different experience for that. And I know Josh and his crew and certainly us are appreciative of that, but uh, would certainly say that's not the standard um, that we get out of. Yeah, you know, you don't – I wouldn't criticize how other people necessarily do things. But I like to get what I pay for, right? And I'm willing to pay more, metaphorically, to get the right person, right? Uh, you know, g- critical issue. We haven't had a constitutional challenge since the contract started. Yeah. Yeah. Use, use of force has been very moderated as necessary. Uh, report writing is is uh, the watchword for what we do. We document everything. Right. 
and uh, I think that's held us in, in very good uh, stead. I agree. And it's an active one. So that's where it's you need a level of security officer that's prepared and can communicate de-escalate. As I have potential clients contact me or about CIDs or about active, you know, community improvement districts, I'm sorry, or active areas that they would like a security footprint in. Um, uh, the city that we were talking about earlier today, their transit issues. Um, that's what I point at. Right. I said, if you want to see it done right. If you want to see if you want to see it done right with the city and private ownership working hand in hand and 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 it, it it's it's well been that's really a good awesome. one too I mean there's a really good partnership there with KCPD and there's been traditionally I think security it's one of the reasons I started the company was they're kind of looked at as a security oh we've got to come and clean this up or we don't want you involved and I think we found a pretty good balance of how that's harmonious and we're not creating stuff for them they get a good level i mean because we it's one of our more elite units that you know people have to it's not a place that somebody goes and cuts their teeth on it no i was at a meeting at east patrol um (laughs) last friday and i believe there was two captains and and a good handful of sergeants or so and and what i they're looking for that 31st and prospect well i'm sorry they're looking from the 25th and prospect into the 35th and prospect area as a possible cid (laughs) there's a lot of a lot of people involved and right now it's just talk and that's fine, but one of the things that I point at is is the success of uh, uh, the transit officers under you know Chief Mills and KCPD's you know uh, advisement. And I and I've told you know I told all those guys who are going to work that Linwood, all those PD guys that worked at Linwood area, I said, you'd be amazing, you'd be amazed at how willing our Titan officers are to be your offensive lineman if you just want right. to be the quarterback for them. Right. You know, yeah, and, you know, we, we do that. Uh, yeah. we, did, we didn't mention this. Uh, and so Stickin was at that meeting, and, and he was the, and he even looked at the PD officers and said, guys, I'll spend five minutes with one of those guys, and yeah. it corrects so many problems. We've right. got embedded KCPD in the ATA. These guys right. are assigned to us full-time. That's who oversees and guides the shall and shall nots right. uh, of, of private security. These these young people learn from those officers who are veterans. Oh, 100%. And it, it's, uh, it's good for us. It's good for them. Well, and it's a coveted, you know, I mean, it, the, the folks that work there want to work there. They're engaged. They're excited to be there because they know they get support. It's It seems to have been a, a good relationship and mm-hmm. uh, one we certainly value. But, um, well... Appreciate you coming out. I know it's generic to say thank you for your service, but man, you've got uh, you paid your dues for sure, and it's uh, a pretty impressive resume. If you could stop it. crashing, thanks. <laughs> right. That would yeah. be fantastic. I, didn't cr- I only crashed. Sorry, once. you get I, shot I, down. I've only crashed once, and I've never had a chargeable accident. Wow! But I've torn up a lot of. A lot of <laughs> If I had to pay for those things, my God. <laughs> You'd be, be a lot of trouble. You wouldn't be showing me the video of that car if you yeah. had to pay for those yeah. things. Yeah. 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 Well, again, thank you very much for coming on. It was an honor to have you here and uh, and hearing your story, too. But um, really appreciate it. Thanks, and Chief. Any other final uh, questions just, before I, we I sign could, off? I couldn't be more humbled. That's it. Thanks, thank Chief. Thank you, sir. Anytime. Appreciate it. Right. We'll see you guys next time. 